Good day, dear great surgeons. We are gonna talk about a very crucial topic in the MRCS. Yes. Anatomy is about 75 questions in the exam and roughly overlapping with other chapters to be more than one third of the exam of anatomy. So if you master anatomy, you will master MRCS. Yes. That's why these voice shots will help you a lot. Let's go together through them. The structure passing through the lesser and the greater sciatic foramen are both medial to lateral, PIN, pen, budendal nerve, internal budendal artery, nerve to obturator internus, pen, budendal nerve, internal budendal artery, and obturator internus nerve. Let's review some surface marking in the thorax. Between the sternum and the manuprium, the angle of Lewis. At E4 and 5, the bifurcation of the trachea and the start of the aortic arch, which makes the aortic arch more vulnerable to be injured at this side, as well as the zygous arch will enter the superior vena cava. The pleura starts above the middle medial third of the clavicle, meets at rib 2, diverge at rib 4. Right is still bar sternal at rib 6, both rib 8. In middle clavicular line and rep 10 in mid axillary line, rep 12 posteriorly. Let's sum up the pleura 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. They are all even numbers. So that remember the shape of the pleura in your head and remember that it com compromises the even number from 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12. The lung. Two spaces left then pleura below six rep, the heart second rep trap to third right rep to six right rep old parasternal to the fifth intercostal space mid clavicle line nine centi from the midline. The mnemonic for the heart two three six and five and a half. So two three six and five and a half. Again, the very common question in the exam. Regarding the angle of Lewis, where the bifurcation of the trachea and the start of the aortic arch and the junction between sternum and the manuprium is a great risk for the aortic arch to be injured. Remember that all the senior muscle is innervated by the median nerve except for the adductor pollicis, which is innervated by the deep branch of the ulnar nerve and tested by Froman test, Froman card test, and it's definite for ulnar nerve injury. Once pyloric plane is very common question to exam. So please listen to this voice from one time to another. The structure passing through the L1 transpyloric plane. The end of spinal cord, the L1 vertebrae, the origin superior mesenteric artery and portal vein, neck of the pancreas, pylorus of the stomach, second part of duodenum, sphincter of Odi. Hilum of each kidney, duodenal flexure, fundus of the gold bladder, tips of the ninth costal cartilage. The frequent question were about the second part of the duodenum, not the first, the second part of the duodenum, and the L1 vertebra, and the neck of the pancreas. So, the confusion always occur in the anterior two thirds. The anterior two thirds. Taste 7, general 5. Taste 7, general 5. Taste 7 is a facial nerve by the corda tympani. Take care. The innervation of the tongue is a very common question in the exam. The tongue receives general sensory innervation from the lingual branch for the anterior two thirds and the sensory, special sensory taste from the corda tympani via the, cr the cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve. The posterior one third of the tongue receives both general and sensory special sensory innervation from the, the glossopharyngeal nerve. A small portion of the region of the tongue receives sensory innervation from the vagus nerve. The inguinal ligament attached to pivot tubercle and anterior superior iliac spine. The inguinal ligament attaches the pubic tubercle and anterior superior iliac spine. 
the mid inguinal point is a halfway between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubis. It's landmark for the femoral artery in the groin. While the midpoint of inguinal ligament, so it's something related to the inguinal ligament, which is most probably the deep inguinal ring. So, mid inguinal midpoint of inguinal ligament, half away between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle. We are talking here about the inguinal ligament itself. So, it's talking about the halfway between the ascis and pubic tubercle, landmark for deep inguinal ring and indirect hernia, medial to this for direct inguinal hernia. So again, inguinal ligament attaches the tubercle to the anterior superior iliac spine. Its midpoint is denoting the deep inguinal ring, while the mid inguinal point is a halfway between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubis, not the right. The mid inguinal point is a cis and pubic, not the pubic tubercle, denoting landmark for femoral artery. During some mandibular gland excision, take care of the marginal mandibular branch of facial nerve, lingual nerve, and hypoglossal nerve. Record regarding the first resistance site faced during insertion of a catheter in the urethra. Membranous urethra is the first site of resistance. Remember, membranous urethra is the first site of resistance. The content of jugular foramen. Anteriorly, inferior petrosal sinus, intermediately, the glossopharyngeal nerve, vagus nerve, and accessory spinal nerve. Posteriorly, sigmoid sinus, by becoming the internal jugular vein, and some meningeal branch from the occipital and ascending pharyngeal artery. Again, the content of the jugular foramen, inferior petrosal sinus, glossopharyngeal nerve, vagus nerve, accessory nerve, the sigmoid sinus, by becoming the internal jugular vein and some meningeal branch from the occipital and ascending pharyngeal artery. Take care during endarterectomy. During carotid endarterectomy, hypoglossal nerve, greater auricular nerve, and superior laryngeal nerve are at high risk of injury. Once pyloric plane is very common question in the records in the exam. Pylorus, neck of pancreas, superior mesenteric artery, and gallbladder fundus kidney hilum, second part, second part of the duodenum, not the first, second part of the duodenum, duodenojugenal flexure, duodenojugenal flexure, and the transverse colon and end of the spinal cord. All of this has a transpyloric plane at L1. Again, pylorus, necropancreas, supremesenteric artery, gorovular fundus, and kidney hilum, second part of duodenum, duodenojugenal flexure, transverse colon, end of a spinal cord in adult. The vertebral level is very important in the exam. Regarding the celiac axis, the celiac axis it branches of the aorta at T12 and its branches are less gastric, hepatic and splenic. Remember the surface marking of the internal jugular and external jugular veins. The internal jugular from the ear loop to the sternoclavicular joint while the external jugular from the ear loop to the mid clavicle. The anatomical snuff box is a must in the exam. So let's be familiar with its boundaries and its content. The boundaries are posterior border, the tendon of extensor pollicis longus, anterior border, the tendon of extensor pollicis brevis and abductor pollicis longus, while the proximal border is the styloid process of the radius. And the distal border is the apex of the snuff box triangle. The floor is the trapezium and the scaphoid. And it contains the radial artery. That's the anatomical snuff box. Extensor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis, abductor pollicis longus. And the apex of the snuff box is the distal border, the proximal border is the styloid process of the radius and the floor is the trapezium and scaphoid and it contains the radial artery. Remember, the femoral hernia exits the femoral canal below and lateral to the pubic tubercle. The femoral hernia 
occur mainly in women due to their difference in the pelvic anatomy. They are at high risk of strangulation and therefore should be repaired. The epiglock foramen has the following boundaries anteriorly in the free edge of the lesser omentum, the bile duct to the right, portal vein behind, and the hepatic artery to the left. Posteriorly, inferior vena cava, inferiorly, first part of the duodenum, and superiorly, the caudate process of the liver. Bleeding from the liver trauma or a difficult cholecystectomy can be controlled with a vascular clamp applied to the epiglock foramen. Just for medical sophistication, do you know that the little finger may have no flexor digitorum superficialis in 10% of the cases? Yes, it might have only the flexor digitorum profunda. A very common recall in the exam regarding the inter OCI in the hand. Which inter OCI adduct and which inter OCI abduct? The palmar inter OCI adduct and the dorsal inter OCI abduct. Remember this mnemonic bad, bad, and dab. The bad palmar inter OCI abduct, while bad, bad palmar inter OCI abduct, while dab dorsal inter OCI abduct. Don't worry if you can't remember and revise the foramina all at once by now. Take them piecemeal. You now have memorized that the foramen spinosum is very important for the midimmunal artery and vein in the sphenoid bone, and that's it for today. Tomorrow, you will remember that the stylomastoid foramen in the temporal bone is for the facial nerve and the stylomastoid artery. Take it piecemeal, not a heavy meal, so you can recall it from time to time. Remember, some Foramina are existing in the sphenoid bone, like foramen oval, spinosum, rotundum, and superior orbital fissure. So, oval, spinosum, rotundum, superior orbital fissure are foramina exist in the sphenoid bone. The foramen spinosum lies in the sphenoid bone and is very important because through it passes the meningeal, the middle meningeal artery and vein. The maxillary artery is divided by the lateral trigoid muscle into three parts. And remember, the lateral trigoid muscle opens, la, open, medial trigoid is mm, close. The lateral trigoid muscle opens the mouth, while the medial trigoid muscle mm, closes the mouth. The inferior thyroid artery is derived from the thyrocervical trunk, a branch of the subclavian artery, while the superior thyroid artery from the external carotid. During right hemicolectomy, the gonadal vessels and reureter are important posterior relations that are at risk. During later stage of the procedure, the iliocoric artery and vein are traced along the anterior aspect of the duodenum. At this point, it's possible to injure these, the superior mesenteric vein or the middle colic vein. Injury to any of these can result in torrential bleeding that is very difficult to control. Although the medial compartment of the thigh is supplied by the obturator nerve, but the adductor magnus has double innervation by the the obturator nerve and the sciatic nerve. Never to forget this. The sciatic nerve root commonly arises from L4, L5, S1, S2, S3. From L4 to S3. So, the border of the femoral canal, laterally, femoral vein, medially, lacunar ligament, anteriorly, the inguinal ligament, and posteriorly, the bicinial ligament. The femoral canal lies at the medial aspects of the femoral cheese. The femoral sheath is a facial tunnel containing both the femoral artery laterally and the femoral vein medially. The canal lies medial to the vein. Remember, the optic canal transmits the optic nerve, while the ophthalmic nerve traverses the superior orbital fissure. The optic canal, optic nerve, ophthalmic nerve, the orbital fissure.
Let's remember that the lateral malleolus have some structure both behind it, posterior to the lateral malleolus, divided by the perineal retinaculum. The structure passing behind the lateral malleus but superficial to the superior perineal retinaculum are the shoulder nerve and posterior saphenous vein, while the structure passing behind the posterior uh, and posterior to the lateral malleus and deep to the superior perineal retinaculum are perineus longus and perineus brevis. Remember, the perineus tertius in the anterior compartment. Phrenic nerve in the posterior triangle, P with a P. When you hear this voice, remember that the phrenic nerve in the posterior triangle. Again, the ulnar paradox. Remember, the higher the lesion, the less the flowing. Unlike the logic. Remember, the internal carotid has no branches in the neck, extra cranial. There is no extra cranial branch for the internal carotid artery. Let's remember the external carotid artery branches. The superior thyroid, ascending pharyngeal, lingual, facial, occipital, posterior auricular, maxillary, superficial temporal. The arterial key compression is a well-established therapy for trigeminal neuralgia. The posterior cerebral artery is often larger than the superior cerebellar artery. The posterior cerebral artery is often larger than the superior cerebellar artery and it's separated from the visor near its origin by the oculomotor nerve. So the oculomotor nerve separates the posterior cerebral artery which is often larger than the superior cerebellar artery. The labyrinthine artery is long and slender and may rise from the lower part of the basilar artery. It accompanies the facial and the vestibulococcal nerve into the internal auditory meatus. The posterior inferior cerebellar artery is the largest of the cerebellar arteries arising from the vertebral artery. Many are familiar with the palmaris longus muscle, but many don't know that there is a palmaris brevis muscle. If there is a longus, there will be a brevis. The palmaris brevis is supplied by the ulnar nerve, unlike the palmaris longus which is supplied by the median nerve and may be absent in 10% of the population. And it's a very important uh, tendon uh, in tendon grafting for the plastic surgeon, by the way. The ulnar nerve innervates all intrinsic muscles of the hand except for two, the senior muscles and the first two lumbricals supplied by the median nerve and the senior muscle not all supplied by the median nerve because we have the adductor pollicis supplied by the ulnar nerve. Regarding the tonsillar fossa, the glossopharyngeal nerve is the main sensory nerve for the tonsillar fossa. A less contribution is made by the lesser palatine nerve because of the otalgia may occur from the tonsillectomy. A very common question regarding the finished teal incision is what structures are being cut during finished teal incision. The skin will be cut. The fascia will be cut. The anterior rectus sheath will be cut, but the rectus muscle will be retracted. The fascia transversalis will be cut. Then you will face the peritoneum. And welcome, you are in the intraperitoneal cavity. So we don't cut the muscle routinely, but retract it. You have to know the rule that the surgeon tends always to retract the muscle, not to cut through it. But you can cut a tendon and re-suture it. So in the upper midline abdominal incision, it will involve the division of the linea alba, and the division of the muscle will not usually improve the axis in this approach. And they would not be routinely encountered during this incision. The terion, because the P is silent, is the region where the frontal, parietal, temporal, and the greater wing of the sinusoid bone join together to form it. It's located on the side of the skull, just behind the temple, and very vulnerable place for the middle meningeal artery.
to be injured and this is a very common record remember the middle meningeal artery runs beneath the terion which is a very vulnerable place to be injured where the scar is thin and very common to be ruptured at this site the motor branches of the radial nerve in brief in the arm it innervates the triceps the three heads of the triceps and anconius the triceps and anconius are the motor branch of the radial nerve in the arm while in the elbow the brachioradialis a long head of the extensor carboradialis and supinator and when it branches to give the posterior interosseous nerve it innervates the extensor carboradialis the extensor digitorum communis abductor pollicis longus extensor indicis propus and extensor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis all nerves share in the elbow joint from the musculocutaneous nerve ulnar medial radial but never the posterior interosseous itself okay even if the posterior interosseous nerve is a branch from the radial nerve but it innervates the extensors of the hand not the elbow joint the posterior interosseous nerve is a motor nerve pure motor nerve and sequentially innervates supinator extensor carpi radialis brevis sensor digitorum communis extensor digiti minimi extensor carpi annaris abductor pollicis extensor pollicis brevis and extensor pollicis longus and extensor indices so roughly we can say that the posterior interosseous nerve innervates the extensors of the hand while the radial nerve itself innervates what? Yes, the triceps muscle. Thoracoacromial artery arises from the second part of the axillary artery. It's a short white trunk which pierces the clavipectoral fascia and ends deep to the pectoralis major by dividing into four branches. The pectoral branch, acromial branch and the clavicular branch and deltoid branch. Regarding the clavicular branch specifically, it runs upward and medial to the sternoclavicular joint, supplying the articulation and the subclavius. The femoral nerve supply the medial cutaneous nerve of the thigh and the intermediate cutaneous nerve of the thigh, along with the saphenous nerve. Those are the branches of the femoral nerve, and they supply the vastus and quadriceps and sartorius, and never forget the pectineus. Vomiting is a reflex of oral expulsion of gastric content, reverse peristalsis, and abdominal contraction. The vomiting center is a part of the medulla oblongata and is triggered by receptors in several locations, like the labyrinthine receptors of the ear, motion section, motion sickness, over distension receptor of the duodenum and the stomach, trigger zone of the CNS. Many drugs like the opiates act here and touch receptors in the throat causing gag reflex. When the nerve innervates the perineum, it passes between the piriformis and the coccygeus, medial to the sciatic nerve. It has three divisions, rectal nerve, perineal nerve, dorsal nerve of penis and the clitoris. All these pass through the greater sciatic foramen. A very famous question regarding the branches of the axillary artery. The superior thoracic artery is the first branch of the axillary artery. It arises from the first part. Let's take the second and the third part. The second part gives rise to two branches, the thoracoacromial and lateral thoracic, while the third part gives rise to three branches, the subscapular artery, anterior and posterior circumflex humeral arteries. And that's it. Take care. There is no brachiocephalic artery on the left side. However, the left brachiocephalic vein lies anteriorly to the roots of the three great arteries, including the brachiocephalic artery. The right recurrent laryngeal nerve has no relation to the brachiocephalic artery. The fossa, like the cubital fossa and the popliteal fossa relations are very important. And regarding a very famous question for the cubital fossa, where the pronator tears separates the median nerve from the ulnar artery. Take care from the compartment. We have thigh compartment and leg compartment. The thigh compartment three, 
while the left compartment are four. The thigh compartment and tear compartment which is innervated by the femoral nerve, while the medial compartment by the obturator and the, and the posterior with the sciatic nerve. While we have four compartments in the leg, anterior, posterior, the posterior are two, superficial and deep, and the lateral compartment. The anterior compartment in the leg by the deep peroneal nerve, while the lateral compartment with the superficial peroneal nerve, and the posterior compartment with the tibial nerve. The bottom of the foot is innervated by the super, superficial peroneal nerve, except for the first web space innervated by the deep peroneal nerve. It's a very common question in the exam records. The lymphatic drainage of ovaries, uterus, and cervix. It's a very common question in the exam. The ovaries drain into the paraortic lymph node via the gonadal vessels, while the uterine fundus has a lymphatic drainage that runs with the ovarian vessels and makes us redrain to the paraortic nodes. Some drainage may also pass along the round ligament to the inguinal lymph node. So the ovaries to the paraortic, the uterine fundus has a lymphatic drainage to a ovarian vessel that drain to the paraortic lymph node but the body of the uterus the body of the uterus drains through lymphatic contain within the broad ligament to the iliac lymph node the uterine fundus to the paraortic the body of the uterus to the iliac lymph node while the cervix the cervix drains into three potential nodal stations laterally through the broad ligament along the lymphatic with the uterocyclar fold to the presacral lymph node and posterolaterally along with the lymphatics lying alongside the uterine vessel to the internal iliac lymph node. Radial nerve injury at the level of the axilla will result in loss of elbow extension and loss of metacarbophalangeal extension and loss of triceps reflex and loss of sensation overlying the first dorsal interosseous. But won't lose the extension of intrapharyngeal joint because this may be still extend by virtue of retained lumbrical muscle function. So the radial nerve injury at the axilla will not cause a loss of extension in the interpharyngeal joint because this will be still with the affection of lumbrical muscle effect, which is functioning by the median and ulnar nerve. Okay, the buddhinna nerve located in the deep renal space and then branches to innervate more superficial structure and not located in the superficial perineal space. The pudendal in the deep perineal space. The brachial artery. The brachial artery begins at the lower border of the tears major as a continuation of the axillary artery. It terminates in the cubital fossa at the level of the neck of the radius by dividing into the radial and the ulnar artery. So the radial and the ulnar artery are branching from the brachial artery and the brachial artery is a continuation of the axillary artery. The median nerve descends lateral to the brachial artery. It usually passes anterior to the artery to lie on its medial side. It passes deep to the bicipital abnormosis and the medial cubital vein at the elbow. It enters the forearm between the two heads of the pronator teres muscle. Very famous recall in the MRCS is the relation between the median nerve relative to the brachial artery. The relation of median nerve to the brachial artery lateral than anterior than medial. The relation of the median nerve to the brachial artery lateral anterior than medial. The contents of the cavernous sinus is frequently asked. And the mnemonic for this contents are all tomcat. Oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, ophthalmic nerve, maxillary nerve, carotid artery, abducens nerve, and autom lateral wall component, while the ca component within the sinus itself. So again, autom cat, autom cat, oculomotor nerve, trochlear nerve, ophthalmic nerve, maxillary nerve, carotid artery, abducens nerve. Lateral wall component, autumn. K are for the component within the sinus itself. A surgical occlusion to the portal vein will cause a great reduction in the hepatic blood flow because the portal vein transports about 70% of the blood supply to the liver, while the hepatic artery provides only 30%. 
The portal vein contains the product of digestion. The arterial and venous blood is dispersed by the sinusoids to the central veins of the liver locules. These drains into the hepatic veins and then to the IVC. The caudate loop drains directly to the IVC rather than into other hepatic vein. So again, the portal vein transports 70% of the blood supply to the liver, which, if occluded, can cause a great reduction in the hepatic blood flow. The nerve supply to the digastric muscle anteriorly via the myelohyoid nerve, posteriorly via the facial nerve. So anteriorly myelohyoid, posteriorly facial nerve. To access the submandibular gland, a transverse incision 3 cm below the mandible should be made. Incisions located higher than this may damage the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. Where does the spinal cord terminate in unit L3? At the third month, the fetus spinal cord occupies the entire length of the vertebral canal. The vertebral colon then grows longer exceeding the growth rate of the spinal cord. This results with the cord being at L3 at birth and L1 to L2 by adulthood. So, it terminates in unit at L3. And by adulthood, it becomes at L1, L2. The structure passing through the foramen ovale can be remembered by oval. O, otic ganglion, V, mandibular nerve, third branch of the trigeminal, V3, A, accessory meningeal artery, L, lesser petrosal nerve, E, emissary vein. So, oval, otic ganglion, V3, accessory meningeal artery, lesser petrosal nerve, and emissary vein. The esophagus histology consists of mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and adventitia, but there is no cirrhosa. So take care. As much as it's easy idea and easy information, but missed a lot. There is no cirrhosa in the esophagus. Another important question is the constrictions of the esophagus. We have four constrictions. The recoil cartilage, 15 cm away from the incisors, and the arch of the aorta, 22 cm from the incisor and left the principal bronchus, 27 cm from the incisors and diaphragmatic hiatus, 4 cm from the incisor. Previously, the needle decompression for pneumothorax was in the second intercostal space mid-clavicular line, but now the needle decompression as an emergency protocol according to the ATLS protocol tense addition in the mid-axillary line, fifth intercostal space. In adults, while in children, it is still kept in the second intercostal space, mid-clavicular line. Take care for this ER action. The muscles of the tongue are genoglossus, hyoglossus, styloglossus, and the intrinsic muscles, and balatoglossus. The genoglossus, hyoglossus, styloglossus, and intrinsic muscle are supplied by the hypoglossal nerve except for the bladder glosses supplied by the vagus nerve. The innervation of the tongue again, motor and sensory. The motor, where all intrinsic and extrinsic muscles are supplied by hypoglossal nerve, except the bladder glosses, which is supplied by pharyngeal plexus by the vagus nerve, while the sensory innervation divided into three parts, the anterior to three, two thirds, and posterior one third, and the root of the tongue. The anterior to third, general sensation by the lingual nerve via the cranial nerve 5, while the posterior one third include the villi papilli, general anti sensation by the glossopharyngeal. The taste sensation in the anterior to third via the corda tympani branch of the facial nerve. The root of the tongue in most posterior part, internal laryngeal branch of the face. The tongue innervation. The tongue receives general sensory innervation from the lingual branch of cranial nerve 5, so general 5, for the anterior two thirds, and the special sensory taste sensation from the corda tympani branch of cranial nerve 7. So, 
General 5 taste 7 for anterior two thirds. The posterior one third of the tongue receives both general sensory and special sensory innervation from the glossopharyngea. The small posterior region of the tongue receives the sensory innervation from the vagus. A very common question in MRT is the layers of the lumbar function. So let's take them from the skin inside. First, you will encounter the skin, superficial fascia, supraspinous ligament, and interspinous ligament, the ligamentum flavin, epidural space, dura mater, arachnoid, subarachnoid space containing cerebrospinal flow. So, the supraspinous ligament is the first to be encountered. Radiculopathy describes a range of symptoms produced by pinching of a nerve root in the spinal column. The pinched nerve can occur at different areas along the spine, cervical, thoracic, lumbar. Symptoms of radiculopathy vary by location, but frequently include pain, weakness, numbness, and tingling. So, symptoms may be like weakness, barthesia. So, this is radiculopathy. The external palatine vein lies immediately lateral to the tonsil, and if damaged, may be a cause of reactionary hemorrhage following tonsillectomy. The branches of the trigeminal nerve, ophthalmic nerve, maxillary nerve, mandibular nerve. So, when you hear ophthalmic nerve or maxillary nerve or mandibular nerve, you remember they are not cranial nerve, they are branches from the trigeminal nerve. And the ophthalmic and the maxillary are only sensory nerves, while the mandibular nerve is mixed, sensory and motor. The trigeminal nerve is the main sensory nerve of the head. In addition to its major sensory rule, it also innervates the muscles of mastication. So, let's have a glimpse over the distribution of the trigeminal nerve. The sensory innervation to scalp, face, oral cavity and teeth, nose and sinuses and dura mater, while the motor, which is the muscles for actions, for muscle of mastication, myelohyoid, anterior pillar of digastric, tensor tympani, and tensor palatine. While the autonomic connection, the ganglia, ciliary, sphenopalatine, otic, submandibular. The branches of the lower molar and premolar teeth are supplied by the branches of the inferior avalon nerve, those of the canine and incisors by the incisive branch of the same nerve. The gingiva and supporting structures are innervated by the lingual nerve. The abdominal aorta branches and level. Let's take them from up down. The celiac trunk at T12, supermesenteric artery at L1, while the imperial mesenteric artery at L3. The aorta bifurcation at L4 to form the right and left common iliacs. There are three openings in the diaphragm very important at T8, T10, and T12. At T10, the esophagus, while the vena cava at T8, the aortic hiatus at T12. So the vena cava at T8, esophagus at T10, aortic hiatus at T12. The longest aortic hiatus, 12 letters, T12. The shortest vena cava, 8 letters at T8. The anterior cervicalis lies anterior to the carotid sheath. The nerve supply to the inferior strap muscle enter at the inferior aspect. Therefore, when dividing this muscle to expose a large goiter, the muscle should be divided at their upper half as high as possible. And the root of the anterior cervicalis is C123. So, it innervates the strap muscle, the sternohyoid, sternothyroid, omohyoid, from inferior aspect. So, when we cut the strap muscle, we should cut it as high as possible to preserve the ansar cervicals. The external anal sphincter is innervated by the inferior rectal branch of the pudendal nerve. This has root value S234. So, S234 keeps up poo. Of the flow. During pregnancy, late in the third trimester, 
The compression by the fetus over the pelvis can cause fecal incontinence due to neuropathy over the pudendal nerve. Then the nerve arises from the nerve root S234, S234, and exits the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen. The pudendal nerve innervates the posterior valval area and routinely blocked in the procedures such as episiotomy. The penis takes autonomic nerve from the nervi urgentis that lie near the seminal vesicle. These may be compromised by the direct surgical trauma such as the use of diathermy in this area and also by radiotherapy that is used in this patient preoperatively. The result is that up to 50% of the patient may develop impotence following rectal cancer surgery. Summarize the sensation of the tongue by this mnemonic. General 5, day 7, day 7, general 5. From the tracks of the mediastinum as well, is that the arch of the aorta exists in the superior mediastinum, while the anterior mediastinum had nothing to do with the aorta. The medial mediastinum contains the aortic root, while the posterior mediastinum contains the thoracic aorta. The tracks of the mediastinal spaces. The thoracic duct exists in the superior and the posterior mediastinum. The posterior mediastinum contains esophagus, thoracic aorta, a zygous vein, thoracic duct, vagus nerve, sympathetic nerve, splanchic nerve. The medial mediastinum contains pericardium, heart, or crude, arch of azygous vein, main bronchi. Anterior mediastinum contains thymic remnant, lymph node, and fat. The superior mediastinum consists of superior vena cava, brachiocephalic vein, arch of the aorta, thoracic duct, trachea, esophagus, sinus, vagus nerve, left recurrent laryngeal nerve, and phrenic nerve. The mediastinum is the region between the pulmonary cavities. It's covered by the mediastinal pleura and doesn't contain the lung itself. It extends from the thoracic inlet superiorly and to the diaphragm inferiorly. The mediastinum region superior, medial, posterior, and anterior. So, let's take each mediastinum region alone. The heart receives its nerve from the superficial and deep cardiac plexus. The cardiac plexus sends the small branches to the heart along the major vessels, continuing with the right and left coronary arteries. The vagal efferent fiber emerges from the brainstem in the roots of the vagus and accessory nerve and runs to the ganglia in the cardiac plexus and within the heart itself. So, there is no Nerve directly innervate the sinoatrial node. The background of vagal discharge serves to limit heart rate, and loss of this background vagal tone accounts for the higher resting, the higher resting heart rate seen following cardiac transplant. By temporal hemianopia is a medical description of a type of partial blindness, where the vision is missing in the outer half of both the right and left visual field. It's usually associated with the lesion of the optic chiasm and due to the optic chiasm close relationship to the pituitary gland, the area where the optic nerve from the right and left eye crosses near the pituitary gland when a hematoma or injury occurs anterior to the pituitary gland, it will cause the optic tract, uh, the optic chiasm uh, to be affected causing by temporal hemianopia. Michael cave, also known as the trigeminal cave, trigeminal cavity, or Michael cavity. It's a cerebrospinal fluid containing dural pouch in the middle cranial fossa and opening from the posterior cranial fossa that houses the trigeminal ganglion. And when it damages it, the trigeminal nerve, which is providing the motor innervation to the muscles of the mastication, the close proximity of the site of injury to the motor nerve fiber is likely to result in at least some compromise of the motor muscle function. 
and the angle of the jaw is not innervated by sensory fibers of the trigeminal nerve and it is spared in this type of injury. Always remember that the cephalic vein is superficially located in the upper limb and overlies most of the fascial plan. Tricks regarding the phrenic nerve. The right phrenic nerve passes over the right atrium to exit the diaphragm at T8, while the left phrenic nerve pierces the diaphragm alone. The left left, while the right is not alone and exits the diaphragm at T8. The phrenic nerve, its origin is C345, supplies the diaphragm sensation, center diaphragm, and bricardium. The phrenic nerve passes with the internal jugular vein across the scalenus anterior. It passes deep to the breeder vertebra fascia of the deep cervical fascia. The left phrenic nerve crosses anterior to the first part of the subclavian artery, while the right phrenic nerve anterior to the scalenus anterior and the crosses anterior to the second part of the subclavian artery. So the left crosses the first part while the right crosses the anterior to the second part of the subclavian artery. On both sides, the phrenic nerve right, uh, runs posteriorly to the subclavian vein and posterior to the internal thoracic artery as it enters the thorax. A very famous fascia we learned in MRCS, septum fascia, is a fascia of the lung. Books for penis, while dire posterior to the rectum, dental VA anterior to the rectum. Kidney fascia are gyrota and zucker candle, just like the rectal fascia, where the dental VA is anterior and while dire is posterior, the anterior renal fascia is gyrota, the posterior renal fascia is zucker candle. Have a nice time and revise this from time to time. Take care. The scalent anterior muscle separates the subclavian vein from the subclavian artery. So, what is prone to injury? The subclavian vein. The subclavian artery is behind the scalent anterior. Take care. The valves of the heart, aortic valve and pulmonary valve and tricuspid valve, all have three cusps, but the mitral valve, like the mitral of the pop, has only two cusps. The aortic and pulmonary cause the second heart sound, but the mitral and tricuspid cause the first heart sound. Regarding the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery, take care from this trick. The right coronary artery supplies the right atrium and the diaphragmatic part of the right ventricle. But take care. The left coronary artery supplies the left atrium and most of the left ventricle and a part of the right ventricle. So, take care again. The right coronary artery supplies the right atrium and the diaphragmatic part of the right ventricle. Usually, the posterior third of the interventricular, interventricular septum is supplied by the right coronary artery and the sinoatrial node 60% of the cases by right coronary so as well so as the atrioventricular node but the left coronary artery supplies the left atrium and most of the left ventricle and part of the right ventricle of course the anterior to third of the interventricular septum and the sinoatrial node in 40% of the cases by the left coronary artery Take it easy, we are not a cardiothoracic surgeons, but we are reminding ourselves. Hear this voice from time to time and you will get it. The carotid cheese is crossed anteriorly by the hypoglossal nerve and the ansa cervicalis. But take care, the vagus is within the carotid cheese itself. The cervical sympathetic chain lies posteriorly between the cheese and the prevertebral fascia. The lateral system gland is innervated by the secretomotor parasympathetic fiber from the pterygopalatine ganglion, which is in turn may reach the gland via the zygomatic or lacrimal branch of the maxillary nerve or pass directly to the gland. The preganglionic fiber 
traveled to the ganglion in the greater petrosal nerve, a branch of the facial nerve at the geniculate ganglion. The upper motor neuron lesion of the facial nerve causes paralysis of the lower half of the face, while the lower motor neuron lesion causes the paralysis of the entire ipsilateral face. Welcome to the group whom the interactive skid will be your guide through this journey. You will find an introductory video with explanation on the tips and the tricks of this exam and how to pass it smoothly. Many experience of, the pay of our uh, previous colleagues are attached. You can read them and understand how this exam experience goes on. May God give you success and happiness. Persistent left superior vena cava is the most common anomaly of the thoracic venous system. It's prevalent in 0.3% of the population and is the benign entity of failed involution during embryogenesis. And the individual is noted to have a left side superior vena cava. The pathway of the blood system most likely to enter the heart via the coronary sinus. Three cranial nerves may be injured during submandibular gland excision, the marginal mandibular and lingual nerve and the hypoglossum. The key to your answer will be the deficit after the nerve injury. The hypoglossal nerve damage may result in paralysis of the ipsilateral aspect of the tongue. The nerve itself lies deep in the capsule surrounding the gland and should not be injured during the intracapsule dissection. The lingual nerve is probably at greater risk of the injury. However, the effect of the lingual nerve injury are sensory rather than motor. Did you notice that in the inguinal canal, the external oblique abenrosis forms the, both the floor and the anterior wall? Don't get confused because it's a canal and the external oblique round over around the canal to form its floor and anterior wall. The floor of the inguinal canal, not only the external oblique, but also the inguinal ligament, of course, and the lacunar ligament. But the trick is the external oblique share in both the floor and anterior wall. Look closely to the diagram and understand it. The genitofemoral branch divides into two branches, femoral and genital. The femoral branch supplies the skin of the upper part of the femoral triangle. But the genital branch passes through the inguinal canal along with the spermatic cord to supply the scrotal skin and the cremasteric muscle. So here we are talking about the genitofemoral nerve. Behind it you will find the femoral artery. Why the femoral artery is posterior to the femoral branch of the genitofemoral nerve? Because the femoral branch supplies the skin of the upper part of the femoral trunk. The genitofemoral nerve divided into two branches as it emerges from the anterior surface of the psoas major. The femoral branch supplies the skin of the upper part of the femoral triangle, but the genital branch passes through the inguinal canal alongside with the spermatic cord and supplies the scrotal skin and cremasteric muscle. In the female, it supplies the skin of the mons pubis and the bia majora. The bladder derived from two sources, the cloaca and mesonephric duct. The primitive cloaca is divided by the urorectal septum into urogenital sinus and rectum. The bladder largely develops from the vesicle part of the urogenital sinus, while the mesonephric ducts are drawn into the floor of the bladder as it expands to form the trigone. The epithelium is derived from the endoderm of the urogenital sinus, where he is the Ureter and the pelvis epithelium are derived from mesoderm. Venous drainage is to the internal iliac vein. The vertex is directed forward toward the upper part of the sympsive pupus and from its median, the middle umbilical ligament, remnant of the urachus, continues upward on the back of the anterior abdominal wall to the umbilicus. The median umbilical ligament are the remnant of the umbilical arteries. The fascia of the pelvic surface of the levator ani is in contact with the inferior lateral surface of the bladder and the prostate. The proteinium is carried by it from the vertex of the bladder on the abdominal wall to form the middle umbilical fold. The transbiologic plane of Addison is important 
as its constant landmark even in the obese patient. It corresponds to the body of the first lumbar vertebrae. A number of important structures may be found at this level like spinal cord and original of superior mesenteric artery, hilum of the kidney, origin of the portal vein, and the gold platter. When you read a hard question and a new idea, don't worry, you don't want to open your textbook to study it. It's a new idea and the scope of the textbook is away from this idea. Just take the idea, take notes, screenshots and reshare, revise and you will get it. Don't worry, you are doing great. Just appearing and trying to answer is doing great. This is chapter 1 in MRCS. We still have 100 days to go. You are lucky to have the online exam through your laptop. The exam soft gives you the option to exclude some answers. And this is giving you superiority to exclude some confusing options. So don't be afraid to choose any answer. Don't worry to choose any answer by now. We are in a training together. So choose any answer or even search for it in Google if it will help you. Now we are improving our point require improvement. That's we are why we are gathered for question posting. Rotator cuff muscle is a very common question in the exam. It composed of four muscles supraspinatus, infraspinatus, tedis minor and subscapularis. During the posterior approach to hip the short external rotators of the hip are divided to expose the capsule. These are piriformis, trator internus, and the gemelli. Although the pancreas is a retroperitoneal structure, it has direct contact with the anterior surface of the left kidney without being separated from it by peritoneum. So, during the exploration of the popliteal fossa, the most common nerve to be injured is the pipian nerve. During injury of the lateral aspect of the leg near the fibula, head will be the common peroneal nerve. Take care from those questions specifically. The popliteal fossa is a very common in the exam. So, let's get familiar with its boundaries. Laterally, Biceps femoris above and lateral head of the gastrocnemius and plantaris below. Medially, the semimembranosus and semitendinosus above, medial head of the gastrocnemius below. The floor is the popliteal surface of the femur, posterior ligament of the knee joint and popliteus muscle, and the roof, the superficial and deep fascia. The content from in out, from the very, very deep to out superficial. The deepest structure is the popliteal artery, then the vein, then the small saphenous vein, and the common perineal nerve, then the most superficial is tibial nerve. The posterior cutaneous nerve of the sinus genicular branch of the nerve, lymph nodes are also in the content. So, the very commonest structure to be injured when exploring or during an injury for the popliteal for the popliteal fossa will be the tibial nerve. The tibial nerve is one of the two ends of the sciatic nerve. The two ends of the sciatic nerve branch in the popliteal fossa which are the tibial nerve and the common tibial nerve. The median nerve is formed by the union of the lateral and medial root respectively from the lateral C5, 6 and 7 and medial C8 and T1. The medial root passes anterior to the third part of the axillary artery. The nerve descends lateral to the brachial artery, crosses to its medial side, usually passing anterior to the artery. It passes deep to the bicipital abdominal and the medial cubital vein at the elbow. It passes between the two heads of the pronator teres muscles and runs on the deep surface of the flexor digitorum superficialis within the facial sheath. Near the rest, it becomes superficial between the tenderness of flexor digitorum superficialis and the flexor carboradialis deep to the palmaris longus tendon. It passes deep to the flexor vitrinaculum 
to enter the palm that lies anterior to the long flexor tendons within the carpal tunnel. To understand the anatomy of the greater and less sciatic foramina, notice that the greater and sciatic greater and less sciatic foramina are formed by the ligaments and the hip bones, while the greater sciatic foramina is divided by the pyriforms. So don't mix them up. There are three structures that passes between both foramina, the greater and less sciatic foramina. The pudendal nerve, internal pudendal artery, and nerve to obturator internus. The pyriforms muscle is a small muscle, and its landmark identifies structure passing out of the sciatic notch. Above the pyriform, the superior gluteal vessels. Below the pyriform, the inferior gluteal vessels. And even the sciatic nerve passes through it. Posterior cutaneous nerve of the thigh also passes below the pyriform. The manubrosternal angle is the angle of flows. It's a surface marking for the aortic arch, and this level, the esophagus is located posteriorly and less risk to injury. Take care that the mediastinum is the region between the pulmonary cavity. It's covered by the mediastinal pleura. It doesn't contain the lung itself. So as well, the vertebral bodies lie outside the mediastinum, and it extends from the thoracic inlet superiorly to the diaphragm inferiorly. Take care, the appendicular artery is a branch from the iliocolic artery, which is already a branch from the superior mesenteric artery. So, the appendicular artery is not a direct branch from the superior mesenteric artery, but from the iliocolic artery from the superior mesenteric artery. Take care, unlike the logic, the gluteus maximus is maximus, but it gets the inferior gluteal artery and nerve, while the gluteal medius and minimus innervated and get blood supply from the gluteal artery and nerve which is superior so the gluteal maximus from the inferior gluteal artery and nerve while the medius and minimus from the superior gluteal artery and nerve the celiac axis has three main branches left gastric hepatic and splenic the hepatic branches are right gastric gastrodudinal superior pancreatic duodenal and cystic occasionally while the splenic branches are pancreatic, short gastric, and left gastroepiploic. So, celiac axis again, left gastric, hepatic, and splenic. The key to this question is that you notice that the venous drainage is from distal to proximal, unlike the arterial supply from proximal to distal. That's why the three of the veins merge to join and not diverge merge to join from distal to proximal. The scalene muscles are three paired muscles, anterior, medius, and posterior. The anterior scalene muscle is an important anatomical landmark and it separates the subclavian there anteriorly from the subclavian artery posteriorly. So, the three paired muscles are anterior, medius, and posterior, and the anterior is a landmark that separates the subclavian vein anteriorly from the subclavian artery posteriorly. That's why the subclavian vein more prone to injury during the clavicular fracture. A very famous question of cardiac anatomy. The trabecular cornea in both ventricles, the muscle bictini in the right atrium only, and the conus arteriosus in the right ventricle only. So. I memorize them like this VT, red B, RVC, VT, ventricle trabecule, red P, right atrium, bictini, RVC, right ventricle, cones arteriosus. So, VT, red B, RVC, trabecular carni in both ventricles, muscle bictini in right atrium only, cones arteriosus in the right ventricle only. The pudendal canal is located along the lateral wall of the ischorectal fossa at the inferior margin of the obturator internus muscle. It extends from the lesser sciatic foramen to the posterior margin of the urogenital diaphragm. It conveys the internal pudendal vessels and nerve. It's not a test. Please, if you don't know the answer, just search for it and answer it. 
We are here to help each other and to motivate each other to search for the answer and know it and share it. The hepatobiliary triangle is very important. Is the boundaries are medially, common hepatic duct, inferiorly, the cystic duct, superiorly, inferior edge of the liver. And important to know that the cystic artery is from its contact. Let's be familiar with the relations of the gold bladder, anteriorly, the liver, posteriorly, covered by peritoneum, transverse colon, and the first part of the duodenum. Laterally, the right lobe of the liver. Medially, the quadrate lobe of the liver. So, it's all bounded by the liver. But posteriorly, the transverse colon, first part of the duodenum, and covered by peritoneum. The arterial supply of the gold bladder is the cystic artery which is a branch from the right hepatic artery and its venous drainage directly into the liver. Its nervous supply, sympathetic mythoracic spinal cord and parasympathetic by the anterior vagal trunk. The flexor digitorum profunda is a very tricky muscle, yet it's very easy after this message. The medial border of the flexor digitorum profunda is supplied by the under nerve. But the lateral side, the lateral half of the flexor digitorum profunda is via the median nerve. And to be more specific, the anterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch from the median nerve. So, in the question, when he asks about the lateral border of the flexor digitorum profunda, yes, it's the median nerve, but more specifically, the anterior interosseous nerve, branch from the median nerve. If a patient presents with superior vena cava obstruction, there are four collateral venous systems. A zygous venous system, internal memory venous pathway, and long thoracic venous system with correction to femoral and vertebral veins, two pathways. Despite this, venous hypertension still occurs. The femoral triangle boundaries are superiorly the inguinal ligament, laterally the medial border of the sartorius, but medially the medial border of the adductor longus muscle, and the roof is a fascia lata. The floor, the marked muscle with the adductor previous, just showing it had anterior division of the obturator nerve on its surface, and the content of the femoral triangle compromising the femoral nerve, femoral artery, femoral vein, deep inguinal nose. So. The femoral triangle is bounded by the muscle and the inguinal ligament, while the femoral ring is formed bounded by a ring within the ligament. The femoral canal is a ring bounded by the ligament, while the femoral triangle is a triangle, hypothetical. Its boundaries are the muscles. Remember, femoral canal and the femoral triangle are distinct anatomical structure. Don't confuse them, especially in the time pursued exam situation. The femoral canal lies in the medial aspect of the femoral sheath. The femoral sheath is a facial tunnel containing both femoral artery laterally and the femoral vein medially. The canal lies medial to the vein. The borders of the femoral canal laterally the vein, medially the lacunar ligament, anteriorly the inguinal ligament, and posteriorly the pectineal ligament. Carpal tunnel anatomy. The posterior border is a carpal bone, anterior border, transverse carpal ligament. And regarding the boundaries, proximally the busy form and tubercle of the navicular bone, and distally the hook of the hemate and the tubercle of the trapezium, and this is the most asked point in the exam the distally hook of the hemate and the tubercle of the trapezium. And regarding the content, the flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profunda, flexor pollicis longus and median nerve. Remember that the palmar cutaneous branch of the median nerve is above the flexor retinaculum and the recurrent branch of the median nerve which supplies the senior muscle which is the median dorsal nerve is branching after the flexor retinaculum. In the forearm, on the nerve supply, the flexor carpi annaris and the flexor digitorum profunda medial half 
and the lateral half by the median nerve. So, when median nerve injury occur, take care that this doesn't mean that the profunda won't act completely because half the flexor digitorum profunda is supplied by the ulnar nerve and the flexor carpi ulnaris will still be working and the hypocenus is supplied by the ulnar nerve. This was a pretty tricky question and very important. Dear friends, let's agree that for mastering MRCS, you have to speak the nerve injury language and the lymph node drainage and the dermatomes. It's a must in the exam. Please listen to the introductory video for MRCS and you will know the must topics in the exam and the must questions in the exam. You don't want to miss a 150 known question to be asked in the exam. Am I right? And take care for the ulnar paradox. We said that more proximal uh, will be more dramatic, but the ulnar paradox is that more distal injury will cause a clawing hand rather than uh, and more than the more proximal uh, cut off of the nerve, uh, the ulnar nerve. That's why it's ulnar paradox. Another trick to understand the electricity of the hand and innervation is that the nerve supplies the muscle more proximal to our upper limb, not distally. So the injury distally is less dramatic than proximal. Proximal is more dramatic, except for the senior muscle, which is inverted by the recurrent branch of the median nerve. Take care of these small tips and tricks. The injuries are very crucial for the exam. And just deal with the nerves like electric cables and they supply a sensory and motor areas. The motor to the muscle and the sensation to the skin. Just remem remember the, the pattern of the sensory innervation and you will get it all. So the lateral side is roughly for the median nerve and the medial side roughly for the ulnar nerve. The discrepancies between them can be with practice be memorized. Regarding the musculature, the intrinsic muscles of the hand mostly with the ulnar nerve except for the senior muscle by the median nerve. And remember that three and a half hand sensation via median nerve while the medial little finger and ring finger via the ulnar nerve sensory and the radial nerve sensation is masked by the median and the ulnar nerve sensation so when the ulnar nerve lost sensation only a coin in the dorsum of the hand near the snuff box is, is lost but all the other sensation of the hand is preserved in the dorsum although all the extensors are supplied by the radial nerve. We'll try to make a clear mini lecture with illustration to make it more clear. Hope this voice note made it a little bit easier. Dearest friends, when you face a hard tricky question that is easily forgettable, share this on the discussion board. Sharing the question will help you revise and memorize the question at least three times, if not five. First, when you first met this question. Second, when you take it screenshot and copy it. Third, when someone answers this question. Fourth, when you check that. Fifth, if any discussion about the related item, revived. Keep the good spirit up, dearest friends. You are all doing great. Together we can with the grace of God. The narrowest part of the urethra in male is the membranous urethra. The solid ideas of the anatomy are taken piecemeal. Just know the idea now. See a diagram from Google Photos for example or a comprehensive illustrative atlas you have. And next day, revise what you have seen during your revision from your screenshot for this question and you will master the anatomy. The diaphragm have a very famous three openings at a very specific levels and very commonly asked in the exam a T8 for the vena cava and T10 for the esophagus and T12 for the aorta so 8 vena cava, 
10 of August 12 Aorta and the thoracic duct accompanying the Aorta at T12. Very common question in the exam. Did you know that the dorsum of the foot is that when you look down and see your foot, this is your dorsum foot? is supplied all by the superficial peroneal nerve except for the first web space in your foot by the deep peroneal nerve. It's funny that the short saphenous vein is accompanying the sural nerve while the long saphenous vein is accompanying the saphenous nerve. So the short saphenous was the sural while the long saphenous was the saphenous nerve. Remember that numbness on the lateral forearm Due to musculocutaneous nerve injury, numbness on the lateral forearm nerve involved is the musculocutaneous nerve. A very famous question about a patient can't flex his distal interpharyngeal joint but can flex the proximal interpharyngeal joint. This is due to flexor digitorum profundus tendon injury because the FDP, the flexor digitorum profundus, inserts in the distal phalanx while the flexor digitorum superficialis inserts into the second phalanx that's why he can flex the proximal interpharyngeal joint but can't flex the distal interpharyngeal joint very famous question about a palm on the table it is asked in two ways Either the patient can't take the thumb from the table or can't bring the thumb to 90 degree. If he can't take the thumb from the table, it's due to extensor pulses longus and the brevis tendon injury. While if he can't bring the thumb 90 degree, it's due to abductor pulses brevis muscle tendon injury. And just as we mentioned that the testicles drains to the paraortic lymph nodes, we have to mention that the scrotal skin drains to the inguinal lymph node, the horizontal group. The lymphatic drainage is very important in the exam. No exam will be empty from a lymphatic drainage question. So, let's clear it up that the testicle and ovaries and uterus fundus uterus fundus and ovaries and testicles drains in the paraaort lymph nodes did you know that a very common question regarding the cardiothoracic and heart in the anatomy that the right coronary artery originates from anterior aortic sinus and above the right crust while the left coronary artery originates from the left posterior aortic sinus and above the left cusp so the right originate from anterior aortic sinus above right cusp and the left from left posterior aortic sinus above left cusp right right left left very famous question about the ulnar nerve injury the ulnar paradox where the ulnar nerve injury at the rest cause mark claw hand while at the elbow which is more proximal causes mild claw hand because at the wrist it causes the intrinsic muscle to be paralyzed causing unopposed action of flexor digitorum profunda causing ulnar paradox there is a tricky question regarding the sensory nerve supply of the ring finger where the ulnar immediate and radial nerve, the three nerves, share in the ring finger sensation. Yes, ulnar median radial nerve gives nerve supply to the ring finger. However, the radial nerve is masked by the ulnar and median nerve. Every line and every word in the inguinal ligament is crucial in this exam. So. No one won't be asked about the deep ring surface anatomy. The deep ring surface anatomy is the midpoint of inguinal ligament. Midpoint of inguinal ligament is the deep ring from the pubic tubercle to the anterior superior iliac spine. 
why the location of the femoral artery pulsation can be felt at the mid inguinal point from the symphysis pubis to the anterior superior iliac spine 1 to 2 cm inferiorly. So, the femoral artery pulsation mid inguinal point, why the deep ring in the inguinal ligament mid point. In hand examination, take care that the adductor pollicis muscle is supplied by under nerve, and this can be tested by from a car test. During phenytheal incision, during caesarean section, take care we cut the skin and the rectus sheath, but the rectus muscle are retracted. We cut only the fascia transversalis and the anterior rectus sheath because there is no posterior rectus sheath at the site of finished teal during delivery. Take care is a very common question in the exam. And yes, this is anatomy. After normal delivery or during delivery, episiotomy may be needed. And when the scenario may state that there is fecal incontinence, you have to suspect a pudendal nerve injury. So, nerve block or episiotomy during normal labor, you have to suspect within the nerve injury if the patient has incontinence. After abdominal surgery, when you find that there is erectile dysfunction, you have to suspect a splanchic nerve injury. Splanchic nerve injury indicating that erectile dysfunction may be happening after abdominal surgery. Nervi orientis. During appendectomy, after grid iron incision, ilioinguinal nerve may be injured. And the funny incidence that during inguinal hernia surgery, as well, ilioinguinal nerve may be injured. In the exam as well, you can find a very simple diet question, just like the vertebral artery is a branch from subclavian artery and passes through the foramen transversum of C6. The surface marking of the internal and external jugular veins. A very common question in the exam. Internal jugular vein surface marking from the ear loop to the sternoclavicular joint. Internal jugular vein from the ear loop to the sternoclavicular joint. While the external jugular vein from the ear loop to the midclavicular joint, the internal to the sternoclavicular, external to the midclavicular, while the anterior jugular vein begins below the chin and runs down under the platysma. Middle meningeal artery is a must in the exam. It will ask you either directly or indirectly, so let's have some notes about it. Minimingual artery is typically the third branch of the first part of the maxillary artery and the maxillary artery is one of the two terminal branches of the external carotid artery. After branching off the maxillary artery in the infratemporal fossa, it runs through the foramen spinosum to supply the dura mater, the outermost of the meninges. The minimingual artery is the largest of the three bird arteries which supply the meninges. The other being the anterior meningeal artery and posterior meningeal artery. The middle meningeal artery runs beneath the terion. So, it's a vulnerable to injury at this point and a very common question in the exam about the terion and the middle meningeal artery. Either asking about the bone forming the terion or the middle meningeal artery as a vulnerable injury place behind the terion in the skull. Rupture of this artery may give rise to extradural hematoma and this is the third most common question in the exam. In the dry cranium, the middle meningeal which runs within the dura surrounds the brain makes a deep indention in the clavicle. The middle meningeal artery is intimately associated with the auriculotemporal nerve which wraps around the artery, making the two easily identifiable in the dissection of human cadaver and also easy damage in surgery. Minimal artery hemorrhage to stop sometimes ligation done near its origin in the auriculotemporal nerve. 
dimension mean occur paresthesia of the epilateral external ear and outermost part of the tympanic membrane. The pterion and middle meningeal artery. The pterion, the piece silence, so it's a pterion and middle meningeal artery are a very common questions in the exam. And the, the pterion is the junction where the frontal and parietal and the greater wing of the sinoid and temporal bone are in close proximity in the pterion. The clinical consequences of a skull fracture in this area can be a very serious problem. The bone in this area is particularly thin and overlies the anterior division of the middle meningeal artery, which can be torn by a skull fracture in this area, resulting in extradural hematoma. So, terion and middle meningeal artery, the bones forming the terion, are a very common question in the exam. A very common question in the exam about avascular necrosis. Very famous sites for avascular necrosis is the humeral head and femoral head, scaphoid, talus, and lunate. Humeral head, femoral head, scaphoid, talus, and lunate. Carpal tunnel syndrome is all about median nerve. So we will have a mnemonic about carpal tunnel syndrome causes. It's a median trap. So let's take every letter together. Causes of carpal tunnel syndrome, myxedema, edema, pre diabetes, idiopathic, acromegaly, and neoplasm, trauma, rheumatoid arthritis, amyloidosis, and pregnancy. So, median trap again, myxedema, edema, diabetes, idiopathic, acromegaly, neoplasm, trauma, rheumatoid arthritis, amyloidosis, and pregnancy. There is a non-surgical treatment may resolve spontaneously after delivery if she is pregnant, for example, but surgically, which is complete division of the flexor retinaculum and decompression of the tunnel. And when you find that debutering contracture is a part of your anatomy schedule, you may wonder, but believe it, it's among your own scope, because it's a fixed flexion contracture of the hand where the fingers bend toward the palm and can't be fully extended. Where is the anatomy in this? Well, the anatomy is that the ring and the little finger are the fingers most commonly affected. Not only this, but the middle finger may be affected in advanced cases, but the index and the thumb are nearly always spared. Not only this, but association with liver cirrhosis and alcoholism However, many cases are idiopathic, and to know that surgical intervention like fasciotomy is a part of the treatment is also a surgically applied information. That's why you have to study anatomy surgically wise like our plan. And all of you who have studied anatomy through EMRCS have noticed that if you have been reading a textbook in anatomy, you won't be focusing on the clinical apply questions like the famous question of the blood supply of the scaphoid bone, which always asks about the blood supply of the scaphoid enters from small non-articular surface near its distal end. So transverse fractures through the scaphoid can carry risk of non-union. This is an applied anatomy information. So if you don't study like the style of this exam, you may miss some points that may affect your grade in the exam, which really matter for us. You don't miss a single mark you can afford. Together we can. Dear friends, by now, all of you have managed to start anatomy, uh, either following our own schedule or their, your own. You have been noticing that the questions in EMRCS are not about anatomy memorization but about applied anatomy so for example when you are asking about a 28 year old man complaining about pain weakness of the shoulder and he has been recently been unwell with glandular fever for example uh, from which he has fully recovered on examination there is some evidence of muscle wasting and degree of winging of the scapula power during active movement is impaired this is a personage Turner syndrome. This is a peripheral neuropathy that may complicate viral illness 
and usually resolve, resolve spontaneously. So, anatomy is not all about the idea of the solid information, but the applied anatomy. So, here you have been knowing about a peripheral neuropathy, complicate viral illness, and resolve spontaneously, like the parsonage. Thank you. Dear great surgeons, it's great you have finished your first wave studying and now you are going through random questions from random chapters, but you have to focus every day to have a specific chapter to revise. And it will be more useful if you have screenshots from the point required improvement from each chapter you are going through today. So today we are going for some upper limb chapter, anatomy. And you are revising either the chapter itself, the questions and the ideas, or the pre-screen shots of the points required improvement for upper limb. This will be beside your daily uh, routine from the mocks or the daily routine from the discussions ongoing in every group you are going through or through the random questions you are going through. But please keep every day chapter or more to revise frequently. Because this is the key, the month away from the exam is a critical month. Because two weeks from the exam, you will be studying strict records. I know records might take your time, especially when you are revising the idea and making sure that the answer of this question is correct or not. Even if you have courses or not, you have to revise the answer and make sure this answer is correct because this question might come in the exam and many will encounter many questions familiar you have seen in the records and wish you have known the correct answer and the only way to revise the answer is by searching for it. This might take time, but this time, you have to keep a side table for a side revision chapter organized. God be with all of you. Encourage each other. Together we can with the grace of God. The ureter is of a big deal in MRCS. It's 25 to 35 centimeter long. It's a muscular tube lined by transitional epithelium and surrounded by thick muscular coat. Becomes the three muscular layers as it crosses the pelvic bone. The retroperitoneal structure overlying the transverse process from L2 to L5. Again, the ureter is retroperitoneal structure that overlying the transverse process of L2 to L5. That's why you are suspecting the stones to be from L2 to L5 and especially as the constrictions. It lies anterior to the bifurcation of the iliac vessels and the blood supply is segmental from the renal artery, aortic branches, and gonadal branches, as well as the common iliac and internal iliac. Again, the blood supply is segmental from the renal artery, aortic branches, gonadal branches, and common iliac, as well as the internal iliac. It lies beneath the uterine artery. This great surgeon, take care from the upper motor neural lesion and lower motor neural lesion of the facial nerve. The upper motor neural lesion of the facial nerve will be affecting the motor cortex connection from the motor cortex to the facial nucleus in the bones while the lower motor neural lesion will be affecting the facial nucleus anywhere around the facial nerve so we are talking about it peripherally and the upper motor will be centrally that's why it's upper and lower it's not about the affected side to be called upper and lower but in the contrast the upper motor neural lesion will affect the lower side, uh, lower half of the face uh, on the other side, while the lower motor lesion will cause the ipsilateral side on the same side of the lesion of the facial nerve will be affected with the uh, lower motor no, uh, nerve lesion. So take care, it will take the whole side in the lower motor, while the upper motor will take the other half lower side. Again, the upper motor neural lesion in the facial nerve will cause effect on the contralateral side, while the lower motor neural lesion will cause ipsilateral side affection. And upper motor neural lesion and lower motor neural lesion can be differentiated clinically by raising the eyebrow. In the lower motor neural lesion, there will be any function can be done with the eyebrow because it will be paralyzed on the same side of the lesion. While in the motor, upper motor neural lesion, you can raise your eyebrow.
Take care. Trigeminal nerve is a mixed nerve. Trigeminal nerve is a main sensory nerve of the head. In addition, its major sensory rule, it also innervates the muscles of mastication. That's why it's a mixed nerve, sensory and motor. In the sensation, it divides the face into three parts and roughly it innervates the scalp, the face, oral cavity, nasal cavity, and sinuses, as well as the dura mater as well. This is with the trigeminal nerve sensory innervation. And the motor muscle supplied by the trigeminal nerve are the muscles of mastication, the myelohyoid, the anterior pelvic diagastric, tensor tympani, and tensor palatini. And the autonomic connection with the ganglia through the ciliary and sphenopalatine and otic and submandibular ganglia. So trigeminal nerve is a very important, crucial nerve. But take care with all those sensory innervation. The angle of the jaw is not innervated by the sensory fiber of the trigeminal nerve, by the way. It's innervated by the great auricular nerve. Take care. Again, the branches of the trigeminal nerve, ophthalmic nerve, maxillary nerve, and mandibular nerve. The mandibular nerve is sensory and motor, and the ophthalmic nerve is sensory only, and maxillary nerve is sensory only, while the mandibular nerve is mixed nerve, sensory and motor. Those are branches from the trigeminal nerves, and those divide the sensation of the face. So take care. With all of these divisions and all of this sensation, again, the angle of the jaw the angle of the jaw is not innervated by those sensory fibers. It's innervated by the great auricular nerve. Different nerve at all. Remember, the taste of the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is supplied by the facial nerve. The trigeminal nerve supplies the general sensation, while the anterior two-thirds supplies the taste. So, taste 7, general 5. Taste 7, general 5. Take care regarding the root of the neck. The lung is found to be projected into the neck beyond the first rib in contrary to your logic if you think in case if you don't know the lung will project into the neck beyond the first level uh, of the first lip it's constrained by septum fascia so septum fascia is a fascia of the lung surrounding it the trunk of the brachial plexus right posterior to the subclavian artery on the first rib and the root of the trunk of the brachial plexus lie between the scanus anterior and the scanus medial muscle. That's why it can be caused uh, a pain and tingling and numbness in the thoracic outlet syndrome. And the thyrosylvicar trunk is a branch of the subclavian artery. But the subclavian artery lies posterior to the scanus anterior, and the vein lies in the front of the septum fascia, in another name for the suprapleural membrane. Thoracic outlet syndrome is very common question in the exam and you will face it in real life. So take care. It's the root of the neck and pretty important because many important structures pass through the root of the neck and the thoracic outlet. The thoracic outlet is where the subclavian artery and subclavian vein and the brachial plexus exit the thorax and enter the arm. They pass over the first rib and under the clavicle. The subclavian vein is the most anterior structure and it's immediately anterior to the scanus anterior muscle and it's attached to the first rib so it's more liable to be injured directly because it's behind the clavicle and anterior to the scanus anterior muscle. So the thoracic outlet syndrome when occur it will affect mainly the artery and the nerves. It will cause tingling and numbness in the hand and will cause the subclavian steel phenomena from the subclavian artery. And we have discussed it before, where the vertebral artery will be flowing backward instead of forward to the contralateral side from the compression on it. So, the scalens anterior has two parts. The subclavian artery leads the thorax by passing over the first rib and between the two portions of the muscle of the scalens anterior. At the level of the first rib, the lower cervical nerve root combined to form the three trunk of the brachial plexus. The lowest the trunk is formed by the union of C8 to T1. And this trunk lies directly posterior to the artery and is in contact with the superior surface of the first rib. So the outlet obstruction causes neurovascular compromisation for this reason, the presence of the brachial plexus trunk and subclavian artery. Seldom you find the subclavian vein inside this thoracic outlet 
compression phenomena. In every exam, there is a question about the thoracic duct, almost every exam. So take care. The thoracic duct is a continuation of the cisterna chylae in the abdomen. It enters the thorax at T12 and lies posterior to the esophagus for most of its interthoracic course and passes on the left of the T5. The lymphatic drainage, the left side of the head and neck, join the thoracic duct prior to its insertion into the left brachiocephalic vein. Again, the lymphatic drainage of the left side of the head and neck join the thoracic duct prior to its insertion into the left brachiocephalic vein. The lymphatic draining in the right side of the head and neck drain by the subclavian and jugular trunk, by the way, into the right lymphatics, and hence into to the medial st uh, the mediastinal trunk and eventually to the right brachiocephalic vein. Its location in the thorax makes it prone to injury during esophageal surgery. So esophageal surgery must be aware from the thoracic duct at this area because some surgeons administer as well cream to the patient prior to the esophagectomy so that it's easier to identify the cut end of the duct. Again, thoracic duct is important, enters the thorax at T12 and passes to the left of the T5 interthoracic course and intraoperative, some surgeons administer cream to the patient prior to the esophagectomy to identify it. Take care in the thoracic duct lies posterior to the esophagus and pass to the left at the level of the angle of Lewis and exits the thorax at T12 together with the aorta. Take care, the thoracic duct is contained within the superior and posterior mediastinum, but it has nothing to do with the middle mediastinum. Again, the thoracic duct will be asked. Either the location is a relation, keep it in mind, it's important. So, the middle mediastinum, by the way, is containing the pericardium, heart, or the crude arch of the azygous vein, and main bronchi, but nothing to do with the thoracic duct. The thoracic duct is in, within the posterior and superior mediastinum. And of course, any tumor or hemorrhage around the pituitary gland will cause a compression of the optic chiasm because it's near from it. And compression over the optic chiasm in regard to the pituitary gland side, it's from below, will cause superior bitemporal hemianopia. It's an important question in the exam. Why the craniopharyngioma, which is compression of the optic chiasm from up, it will cause inferior bitemporal hemianopia. Pituitary gland is a very important gland in our body. It's located within the cella turcica. Cella turcica means a very fancy Turkish uh, chair, by the way, within the sphenoid bone in the middle cranial fossa. Again, pituitary gland in the middle cranial fossa. It's covered by the dural fold and weights around 0.5 gram. It's a small but very important. It's covered because it's very important. It's a very unique place in our body because it's very important. It's like the controller of all glands. It's attached to the hypothalamus by the infundibulum. The anterior pituitary receive hormonal stimuli from the hypothalamus by way of the hypothalamus pituitary portal system. It develops from depression in the wall of the pharynx, the ratix bouts. The hormonal secreted by the pituitary gland are very important to be memorized. The posterior pituitary hormones are two, oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, the ADH. So, posterior pituitary hormones are two, P2, oxytocin and ADH. The anterior pituitary hormone is very important from their name, you can be astonished what it can do. The gross hormone, the thyroid stimulating hormone, the ACTH and prolactin as well as LHFSH and melanocyte releasing hormone. So, we have six hormones from the anterior pituitary gland and two hormones from the pituitary gland. Or you can say LH and FSH are different hormones, so it's are seven. They are seven from the anterior and two from the posterior. Because the anterior, again, gross hormone, thyroid, stimulating hormone, ACTH, prolactin, LH, and FSH, as well as the site releasing hormone. Why the posterior pituitary hormone, the oxytocin, which is the hormone of love and antidiuretic hormone. Those are very important controlling the whole body system. And by the way, it's very 
dangerous to have the pituitary gland destroyed and postpartum hemorrhage after delivery of a baby postpartum hemorrhage after delivery of the baby may cause a lady to enter a very serious necrosis of the pituitary gland due to Sheehan syndrome it's very important she will have hormonal therapy for the rest of her life otherwise she will be a dead body take care the phrenic nerve origin is T3, 4, and 5. It supplies the diaphragm sensation of the central diaphragm and pericardium. The past is pretty asking in the exam of the phrenic nerve because we have left and right phrenic nerve. Take care. The phrenic nerve passes with the internal jugular vein across the scalenus anterior. On both sides, it passes deep to the prevertebral fascia of the deep cervical fascia. But take care. The left phrenic nerve, the left Frank nerve crosses anterior to the first, the left with the first, F and F, left, first, the first part of the subclavian artery. Why the right anterior to the scalenus anterior and the cross anterior to the second part of the subclavian artery? On both sides, the phrenic nerve runs posterior to the subclavian vein and posterior to the internal thoracic artery. So, we are talking about it's posterior to the subclavian and posterior to the internal thoracic artery when it enters the thorax, but anterior to the scanus anterior and the anterior part of the subclavian artery. The left will be first part of the subclavian artery, while the right, the second part of the subclavian artery. The right phrenic nerve in the superior gestinum anterior to the right uh, to the right vagus and lateral to the superior vena cava and the middle mediastinum will be anterior to the right pericardium it passes over the right atrium and the exit the diaphragm at t8 while the left phrenic nerve passes lateral to the left subclavian artery aortic arch and the left ventricle and passes anterior to the root of the lung and pierces the diaphragm alone so the left is left alone while the right is not alone passes at t8 take care this and serenus this and serenus this term means literally a goose foot quack 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 goose foot refers to conjoined tendon of three muscles of the thigh uh, it inserts into the anteromedial front and inside surface of the proximal tibia so again is a conjunction of tendon of three muscles of the thigh insert in the anteromedial front and inside surface of the proximal tibia the muscles are sartorius gracilis and semi tendinosus and sometimes referred to as the guy rope against the pes anterinus, the goose foot. Pes anterinus is sartorius, gracilis, and the semi tendinosus. A very important question about anterior section of the cancer in outpatient clinic: the patient is complaining about impotence. It most probably have damaged his nervi adrenatus nerve the damage to the nervi urgentis nerve will cause impotence the penis takes the autonomic nerve from the nervi urgentis that lies near the seminal vesicle this might be compromised by direct surgical trauma such as use of diathermy in the area of the pelvis and also by radiotherapy as well this is this patient preoperatively have to be consulted regarding this the result is that up to 50% of the patient may develop impotence following rectal cancer surgery. Take care. Rectal cancer surgery will cause impotence, but if not treated, will kill the patient. Take care. The lacrimation reflex to tear occur in response to conjunctival irritation or emotional event. The conjunctiva will send signals by the ophthalmic nerve, but take care. This is not the effluent. The fibers of the ophthalmic nerve will send impulse to the superior salivary gland center, and the efferent signals pass via the greater petrosal nerve to the petrosal nerve, which carries the postvingular sympathetic fiber, and the parasympathetic fiber will relay in the pterygopartine ganglion, and the sympathetic fiber don't synapse, and they in turn will relay on the lacrimal apparatus. The lacrimal gland is innervated by the secretomotor parasympathetic fiber from the pterygopalatine ganglion. The preganglionic fiber 
travel to the ganglion in the greater petrosal nerve, which is a branch from the facial nerve at the geniculate ganglion. Take care, the great auricular nerve originates from the cervical plexus and composed of the branches of spinal nerve C2 and C3. It provides sensory innervation of the skin over the parotid gland, which is the angle of the mandible, uh, the angle of the jaw, and the mastoid process, and both surface of the outer ear. The pain resulting from the parotitis is caused by the impingement over the great auricular nerve. And the very common question in the exam about the sensory innervation of the auricular nerve, not directly, but will tell you all of those are features of uh, the trigeminal nerve, except and will give you a hint about the area, about the angle of the jaw. Because the trigeminal nerve, we all agree that it innervates almost all of the face with all of its branches, the three branches, the ophthalmic, the maxillary, and, and uh, uh, mandibular nerve, the branches of the trigeminal nerve innervate almost all the face except for this specific part for the great auricular nerve and it's a different nerve, it's a special nerve from the C2 and C3. Take care. Very famous tricky question about the cephalic vein, asking what structure can be above the cephalic vein. Take care. The cephalic vein is superficially located in the upper limb and overlies most of the fascial planes. It pierces the coracoid membrane in continuation of the clavipectoral fascia, by the way, to terminate in the axillary vein. It lies anterolateral to the biceps. It's most superficial. What can be above it? The cephalic vein story starts from the dorsal venous arch, which it drains lateral into the cephalic vein, crosses the anatomical snuff box, and it travels lateral up to the arm. At the anticubital fossa, it connects with the basilic vein by the medial cubital vein. And remember, the cephalic vein is a most superficial vein, as for superficial structure. It pierces the deep fascia of the deltobicular groove to join the axillary vein or form the axillary vein so again the cephalic vein is a continuation of the dorsal venous drainage uh, arch and joins the basilic vein with the median cubital vein to go up and form the axillary vein the cavity bone is the largest of the carpal bones it's centrally placed with a rounded head set into the cavities of the lunate and the scaphoid bone the flatter articular surface are present for the hemming medially and the trapezoid laterally and distally the bone articulate predominantly with the middle metacarpal and as Dr. Naveen said it's like the captain bone it's in the center and has no relation with any other nerves like the nerve of the ulnar nerve which is a direct question from the EMR test. Again, cavity poon is a captain poon, according to Dr. Naveen, great mnemonic, and it's in fact the largest of the carpal poon and centrally placed.